Ladies and gentlemen, it's that time. Yet another mock draft. So let's get it started. What's up, friends? It's your boy, Dom C, here on another episode of the Draft Dodgers. little special today. Um, my normal co-host isn't around. I reached out through the dredges of Twitter and YouTube and found the perfect guy to come on here and talk a little first-round draft with you. Um, without further ado, let's bring up our special co-host of the day, Peter, the mock draft guy, dude. What's happening, man? Dom, oh, man, this has been a long time coming. I'm super yeah. happy to come on, dude. I love yeah. the intro, by the way. The the draft dot first off, draft Dodgers is an incredible name, but <laughs> so that is awesome. I'm super happy to be on, and I'm I'm excited to get this going, dude. Yeah, me too, dude. Uh, I mean, listen, we've been trying to collaborate for a while now. I'm glad it, I'm glad it finally got to work. Um, we do a lot of you know similar content, and um, I want to get out there and and kind of you know, shake hands and, and collaborate with all the, you know, premier top, you know, draft gurus out in the Twitter sphere and, and the YouTube world. And uh, you, my friend, were right there on top. So again, pleasure. Appreciate that. Um, guys watching this, listening to this, you'll see right across the bottom, uh, you'll see the mock draft guys, YouTube page out there. I mean, there he's got over 7,000 subscribers. He's not new. If you're into this draft content, I'm sure you're following him. If not, go ahead. Do Pete a favor, give him a, a like and follow and, and hit that bell and subscribe. You can do the same for Project Prospect um, at any time. You know, now is better. Later will work too. So um, <laughs> what do you say, man? First, first before we get into the draft, um, this draft cycle has been bonkers. You know, I, I think the portal plays a whole, puts a whole new spin on this thing. So, you know, give me your you know, uh, overall kind of, uh, view of, of this class and, and this cycle, how it's been going so far with the, with the portal and, and all the people that are now taking their, accepting their bids, the, you know, the senior bowl and the hula bowl and all that stuff. The, the portal itself is so cool and, and so interesting and so frustrating at the same time, Oh, because, I know it. you know, I, I spend and, a ridiculous amount of time looking through prospects and evaluating prospects and some guys like like one of the the real like knife to the chest for me was when princely uman milan said he was going to transfer yeah. one of my favorite one of my favorite prospects in the entire draft class i'm like oh like damn all right but the way that i look at it kind of glass half full i'm like all right well 2025 i already got some some scouting reports done for 25 already but yeah you know I, I get it. The NIL, the, the 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 portal, everything plays into it. What what my thing is, if you're going back to school, going through the transfer portal to make money through an NIL, you know what? All all power to you because this sport, you know, tomorrow's not guaranteed. You go make money wherever you can. And I I 100% am behind it and I support it. It's just a little frustrating as an evaluator. No, absolutely. I hear you. Like, listen, the, the schools, the colleges and the NCAA made millions and millions of dollars off these kids for so long. Like it's, it, it's time that they, you know, these kids go and, and, you know, do what's right for them and their families, man. Absolutely. You know I mean? and, and like you said, you know, it's been a little bit frustrating because a lot of guys that I spent time and, and, and kind of crunched through tape on have already, you know, said they're going back or kind of on the fence. Uh, and if Marvin Harrison decides to go back, I quit. I'm, I'm, just, I was, I'm quitting right. YouTube period. I'm done for the season. I'm coming back in 25. If that's yeah. the case. <laughs> so, um, so yeah. So why don't we get into this, man? We're going to do a first yeah. round for you guys. Um, just you know, we're gonna we're gonna spit right off the cuff. Um, you like myself are both Jets fans, so I'm gonna give you the honors and and I'll give oh. you the even since the Jets line up here as oh, the uh, as the <laughs> number six. Let me share my screen here so we can get going. Thanks for bestowing that honor upon me for sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I don't want to. No pressure. No pressure. But uh, you know, Jets. The Jets universe is uh, you know 
they're asking. So I'll leave I'll, I'll leave the answers to you. So we're going to use PFF. It's the one that I'm more com- most comfortable with. As you see, I got folks, boys and girls, I got all the teams picked. We're going to do one round. Uh, and we're going to go ahead and get this thing started. And, and that would leave me off with Chicago. So it's so funny because I think that this pick, there's still no definitive answer, you know? Um, yeah. What is Justin Fields? And 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 here's my thought process. All right, I, I think Justin Fields can be a, a decent starter. With still has some learning to do. I think he's his ceiling is still rather high. Um, the catch I have, or the way I take it, or the way I interpret it, is is I'm assuming a whole staff gets you know gets wiped out. They're going to clean house, and if that's the case. Um, a, a new a new coach is going to kind of want to come in and and bring his own guy. So for that alone i'm gonna stick and pick here with chicago and i'm still going to go with the guy that i think um is going to be the number one overall whether it's with chicago or whether somebody trades up for this exercise here it's going to be chicago and i'm going to take caleb williams listen caleb williams cut his teeth in oklahoma um followed the footsteps of of kyler murray and i think i see a lot of Caleb Williams game in Kyler Murray, except with a much stronger arm, you know, does a lot, you know, we, we know what he can do off platform. You know, he's mobile enough to get outside the pocket. He can make any throw on the field. Um, You know, he's a winner. I like the, I like the moxie that he plays with. And for me, I know there's been some grumblings that, you know, people are starting to push Drake may up over Caleb Williams for, for me, I'm not there yet. And I still think Caleb Williams is probably the best quarterback in this draft. So he's going to be, the Chicago Bears number one overall pick, and you know whoever the new coach is, whether it's Harbaugh, probably not, or or whomever comes in, is going to get their pick of the litter to to kick off and, and start the rookie quarterback contract with uh you know with a premier player in Caleb Williams. I gotta agree with you, Dom. I mean, it's so rare that you get back to back years with the number one overall pick, and you know what? I honestly think they made the right decision last year. I think that they're, you know, you, you got it again this year. You you can't, you know, you traded it away last year. You got a haul. You could probably do that, probably get more, honestly, this year mm-hmm. than last year. But I, I would stick and pick. I would do the same thing. A lot of a lot of Bears fans, I'm sure you know this too, really are are not with that. They really want to, they really want to stick with, with fields. I mean, there are some that love him, some that absolutely hate him, but I, I got to agree with you. You got to stick and pick there. And then, subs, I mean, the, the consequence of Caleb Williams going number one overall is Drake May going number two overall to the Patriots. I mean, yeah. that that one to me is a no brainer. I feel like I feel like if these four, if these first four picks were stick and picks, I, I feel like they're, they're all very, you know, cut and dry. And yeah. Caleb Williams, Drake May, obviously, number two, uh, you could really stick anyone else in there other than, you, you know, Mac Jones or Bailey. Well, Bailey Zappi played pretty well on Thursday to get to be fair. But he, that I, I'm not willing to take ba- Bailey Zappi over Drake May at this point. Yeah, I, listen, I I agree. I mean, they're gonna they got a whole big reset going on in New England, and yeah. you know, you're God willing, you're only picking this high with this caliber of quarterbacks, you know, in the field, you know, every so often. I don't think that you can pass if you're Absolutely. if you're New England, Absolutely especially not. not especially not for somebody like like uh, Bailey Zappi for sure. So. Um, that leaves the Cardinals up at number three, and I listen as you said. I think it's a no-brainer. I mean, I, I think they're going to be smitten if they're sitting here, um, and Marvin Harrison is still on the board. Now we talked about briefly. You know, there's grumblings that he can go back to school. I don't see how it makes sense for him. Right? Um, realistically, you know, quarterbacks are always bumped up the board. Um, you know, could he, you know, come back, repeat the season that he did this year where he was the, you know, I, I, if I'm not mistaken, I think he was the Blitnikoff winner, right? The the best wide yeah. receiver and best wide mm-hmm. receiver in college football. Um, you know, repeat these stats. You don't know who's going to be a quarterback at Ohio State. You know, I know he said all the right things. He wants to go there and he wants to win a Big Ten championship. He wants to beat Michigan. Um, but you only get a chance to be a top five pick every so often. And as you said earlier, Pete, there's no guarantees in football. So um, Arizona's going to, you know, give Kyler another weapon. And, you know, you got Marvin Harris in there. You got Michael Wilson. You got, you know, some of the slot guys that they got. You, you have a nice little stable of receiving uh, receivers there, especially the tight ends playing good too. It, to me, 
Um, no brainer. I'm going to take Marvin Harrison here every day, every day of the week if it's on the board for the Cardinals. Yeah, 1,000%. And Washington at four is an interesting case. Only reason why is because you see those top three guys that are left on the board right there. Man, you mm-hmm. can make a case for any of those three being the pick here. Uh, Olaf Ashanu, Brock Bowers, Laiatu Latu, 100%. It's, to me, if I was a Washington fan and Roger Goodell came across that that stage and made a pick and one of those three guys were the name, it wouldn't. I wouldn't even bat an eye. I'd be happy with all three. Here's what I'm going to do, though. I, I, I mean, you have to solidify the offensive line. I really do believe that Sam Howell is the quarterback, at least of the near future, for the Washington Commanders. And regardless, a lot of people love to say, oh, well, you're in a prime spot here. You know, you, you got only two of the quarterbacks are off the board. Could be a trade down spot. I, I think they're less inclined to trade down with those two second round picks, to be quite honest with you. I think they stick and pick here. And I think you got to take Olaf Ashanu. For me, the best tackle prospect. He was honestly the best tackle prospect last year for me. Yeah. And he yeah. repeats again this year as the best tackle prospect. And you just got to get Sam Howell some protection. You got to, I mean, their run game is is not great. You need to really fortify that offensive line. And, and it might not be the sexiest pick at number four, but I got to take Ola. No, I, I agree with you. And I'm glad that you said that because um, the rankings last year were for me. He was my OT1 last year coming all, you know, coming yep. out. Um, the kid just turned 21. Um, you know, you wanted to come back and you wanted to see him continue what he did, um, uh, you know, against the pass, which he did. You know, the, he's only let up two two pressures all all year, two sacks in his career. Um, but you hope to see him kind of take that next step and, and, and get a little bit more physical at the point of attack and and, and blow guys off the ball. Uh, I think he's improved in the run game. I don't think he's the mauler that some of these guys that we'll talk about later in the draft yeah. are. But um, to me, uh, like I said, uh, I think he's the I think he's the hands down best tackle prospect in this class and probably one of the best that we've seen in a while. Um, and that leaves me back on the clock with Chicago. A uh, couple options here. Um, man, you know, I, I'm going to say this. I'm going to I'm gonna say this right off the bat. I'm a big fan of Leatu Latu, um, but I don't think he's going to be taken this high. I think the the medical red flags are, are a thing, and I think they're going to come into play. And you're only, you know, you have two picks in the top five that can really – Turn your franchise over. And I'm not saying that Leatu Latu is not a good player because he is, but you, you don't want to take I, – I, I think no GM is going to want to take that risk. I think you're going to want to, want to take a, a, a more of a sure thing. All right? So that takes Leatu Latu off the board. I think Joe Walt is, is a reasonable uh, option here. Um, you can shuffle some stuff along the offensive line. You got some guys on the outside, obviously not on the right side, but on the left side where you can move into guard and let Joe Walt come in and, and be your left tackle of the future. But I'm going to shy away from that because I think there's some depth, especially in the interior. Um, and like I said, Braxton Jones hasn't been bad. Um, so I don't think it's a, it's an immediate upgrade that's necessary. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to take I'm going to take what I think is it, probably one of the, you know, I hate to use the word generational because it's used way too often. Um, I agree. But there's a couple guys in this class that I think you can make arguments for generational talent. And, and my definition is, is that you're not going to see players of this skill set, body type, w- w- players of this caliber for the next 10 to 15 years. Okay. Um, and to me, that's Marvin Harrison. And the Chicago Bear, the Chicago Bears fifth overall pick Brock Bowers. Um, yep. Listen, Cole Komet's there. I know that. I know that he got paid, but Brock Bowers is more than just a tight end. I mean, he you know he can run routes, you know, and and he breaks off at the end of the stem just as good as wide receivers in this class. He's fast. You can play him out in the slot. You can play him inside at twelve personnel. He's you know he, he can still affect the game as a run blocker. Um, you can put him in the backfield, you know, kind of like that H back or or. Yep. You know, just a, a an offensive weapon. I think that's how Brock Bowers is best described as an offensive weapon. I know a lot of people, for some reason, have soured on him. I've been going back and forth with people on Twitter about Brock Bowers. Um, to me, what I've watched on film the past two years tells me that that this kid's going to be a, a very, very special, very good player at the next level. And 
like I said, there's not going to be a guy in this class at the time, not in this class, in any class for the next while at the tight end position, similar to Brock Bowers. I think you don't, you, you don't risk that you take it and you make it work and you put another weapon on the field here for Caleb Williams. So. Yeah, I, I, I'm so glad that you said that with the generational thing. I've been saying in, in videos pr previously that the word generational gets thrown around, especially on Twitter, way too much. Mm -hmm. And But legitimately, I think that there's two guys in this draft class that are generational, and those two being Marvin Harrison Jr. and Brock Powers. I've gone on record. A lot of people don't agree with me on this, and I'm surprised. I, I've said that Brock Powers is a better overall prospect than what Kyle Pitts was coming out of Florida. Me too. I just think – I, I just think that the, the whole blocking aspect as well, I mean, just for that value alone, being a much better blocker than Kyle Pitts was is 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 good enough for me. But he's sensational. That's a great pick. Like you said, you could put him anywhere and yeah. he's he's going to affect the game. Now, our New York Jets at number six. And uh, yeah, this is going to be a trade down spot for me, uh, for sure. And the reason why is I hate the gap between, okay. I believe as of right now, what is it? Six and 72 or something like that. 70. Uh, yeah, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. Some, somewhere around that, that gap is too big for me. And, okay. and with the needs that the jets have, it's not going to be far down. I'm going to trade number six with number nine with the new Orleans saints. I think that the saints have seen enough up until this point to, to kind of warrant a trade up to leapfrog the New York giants here. Um, yeah, I was gonna say whatever. whatever yeah, we're gonna we're be. listen. This is a first round mock, so we're gonna make it work. But yeah. I'm assuming you're gonna want a second rounder back in there. I'm definitely and... gonna want a second rounder. And I honestly think, uh, in terms of dra the, the dr trade downs that we've seen in years prior, that might be enough just to get the job done. Just those two picks right there. Yeah, I mean, even if it was forced or not, that would probably be it. Six is gonna be Jaden Daniels for me for the New Orleans Saints. Uh, I think that the <laughs> the Saints. Some are, are, are a team that are playing in the weakest division in football. And with mediocre quarterback play, they are a perennial division winner, it seems like. And, and it seems like it's not going to get better anytime soon. I mean, look at that. Tom Brady won the division last year at eight and nine mm -hmm. with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. So, I, I mean, the, the Saints are getting older on the defensive side. You know, they, they could use upgrades all along the defense. But the defense is still playing really well to the point where they could be a legitimate contender in the NFC with good quarterback play. And they haven't got that from Derek Carr. I think that quarterback that contract is a disaster already. Jameis Winston is Jameis Winston. You know, what are you going to do? Uh, Jaden Daniels is going to be the pick here for me because I, I just I, we've seen these draft risers before. Uh, he reminds me a lot of a more refined version of Anthony Richardson, at least from last year in terms of draft rising. Mm -hmm. Um all the physical tools are there. He's an incredible playmaker. The one knock that I had against him last year was he didn't take chances. He didn't throw the ball the, down the field a lot. 51% of his throws last year were between zero and five yards from the line of scrimmage, which is an unbelievable stat. But his yards per attempt are I, I, not off the top of my head. I don't remember. It's somewhere in the nines or the ten or the double digits. It's incredible this year compared to what it was last year. He's taken the leap forward. And this is a year to year leap. That really reminds me of Joe Burrow before he got drafted. I know that might be a lazy comparison because of LSU, but I just can't help but think before that record-setting year that Joe Burrow had, he was kind of that guy where it's like you could see the talent. He hasn't put it all together, and I think Jaden Daniels has really put it all together this year. Yeah, and, and I think that Jaden Daniels and, and Anthony Richardson comp is, is really good, is really fair. However, if you're looking just by the numbers, I mean, Jaden – Jaden Richardson completed passes at such a high oh, yeah. level. So, you know, although he might not have the body and the and the frame that Anthony Richardson did, I mean, he's a little bit he's a little bit svelte, if you ask me. Mm -hmm. um, probably, you know, going to need to put some muscle on to really hang in there. Um, you know, he he's already much more of a refined quarterback than Anthony Richardson. You know, they're both ridiculous athletes. Listen, I like the pick of. Uh, I like Jaden Daniels. I, I've kind of honed in on a couple teams that I think make a lot of sense for Jaden Daniels. The Saints being one of them, the Raiders being one of them, especially if they bring back AP. You know, and you yeah. can match up. Uh, you can match up Daniels from his Arizona State days with Antonio Pierce. Uh, you know, who coached him at Arizona State. So um, those are two of the teams that I like. I don't know if the Giants. You know, if he was on the board, if if he's kind of that that fit or mold, I don't know. I and I'll tell you right now because I'm up for the Giants, and, and I'm going to shy away from the quarterback. Um, 
and I, you know, the Giants fans that I know and I talk to and I communicate with, you know, um, it, it's so far, it's there is just polarizing opinions on one side or the other. Oh, yeah. One, you know, there there's still a team that are, are very pro Daniel Jones, and, and there's a team that that have seen enough and are ready to move on. The reality is, is that Daniel Jones is going to be the giant, a giant next year. There's no getting out of that contract next year. Now, two years from now, three years from now, um, the hit and, and the cap hit becomes a little bit more um, palatable. So, yeah. um, I think you, I think it's fair to say that the Giants may look quarterback, but I don't know if they're going to look quarterback this high. So, what I'm going to do is I'm going to give another weapon. To Daniel Jones and you know and, and this offense. Listen, their wide receiving core is what it is. You know, Par you know, there's Paris Campbell and Isaiah Hodgins and um Wandell Robinson and you know uh I know Hyatt, the kid from Tennessee, Jalen Hyatt, uh, you know, a lot of Giants fans are really in love with him. I was not a fan of his tape coming out last year. I thought he was, you know, more so a a, a product of the scheme. Uh, what happened in Tennessee, big arm from big arm from the quarterback and, you know, the, the coach scheming him open. Um, they did a really good job in doing that. So I, I think he's more of a, you know, uh, you know, stretch deep, deep threat guy. So I'm going to bring somebody in who's can still get up the field, can still, you know, um, push the safeties um, route running, you know, yards after the catch, you know, arguably some might say the best, receiver in college football this this past year in Malik Neighbors. I know he's a little bit I, I know he's a little bit smaller than some of these other guys. And some might say that the size of the wide receiving core is a little bit redundant. But listen, if you got somebody that that runs um as well as Malik Neighbors and can do as much with the ball in his hands after the catch, um, you don't hesitate. Like to me he's a he's a top 10 pick through and through and I think he'll fit he'll fit any offense, but especially Brian Dable will be able to scheme him open. So Malik Neighbors is going to be my pick. Yeah, I like that pick a lot. Uh, a lot of people recently, kind of like what you said with Brock Bowers, a lot of people soured on Malik Neighbors that I've talked to because of his, he's just essentially a one-dimensional wide receiver. And I don't see that. A no. lot of people say that he's just he's just a deep threat. He doesn't have any moves at the line of scrimmage. He, he just runs straight past the corner. I don't see that at all. I think that he is a fantastic weapon for any quarterback. And he's one of those guys... That, yeah, you might look at him more of a slot archetype. Don't forget, he's six foot, 200 pounds. That's not small by any means. And he's definitely fast enough to play in the slot. I think he could be a boundary wide receiver pretty consistently. He reminds me a lot, at least size wise, of Jamar Chase. And I think that he he's going to be great. I, re I really do believe that. I love that pick there. I, I, I wouldn't have a problem with that at all. At eight, man, what a situation for Tennessee. Hmm. You got all the wide receivers in the world on the board. You got premium offensive line talent and that's what we're going to go with here now for me this is super tough and the reason why is because i love the fit of talisi fuaga in tennessee but that to me is without joe alt on the board yeah. so with joe alt on the board i think this is going to be a no-brainer it's got to be joe alt to the tennessee titans just you know if you're going to continue with this power run scheme you're a run first team you got to fortify the offensive line and I think for the talent that they have on the team, they've actually done a pretty decent job so far this year. But that's not an excuse to not attack the offensive line early in the draft. So Alt is a pretty much a no brainer at eight. Yeah. And um, I think you just crushed all the hopes and dreams of every Jet fan that's going to watch yeah, this. Sorry, got to do it, man. Got to yeah. do it. <laughs> and that and, and that and, and unfortunately, now the Jets have switched down and moved down to an odd number here. Mm -hmm. Um so the, the pick is mine and I'm actually, I'm actually going to trade down again. Okay. I'm actually, <laughs> I'm actually, actually going to trade down again. Listen, um, I think if alt's on the board, you go, I, I think that there's six guys that to me, if, if they're there, you stick and pick. It's obviously the two quarterbacks we were, we're, we're not going to be in, in room for, um, you got Harrison, you have Bowers. I know Jets fans won't like that, but I think Bowers it, it, Bowers will be in play or there will be a discussion oh, yeah. at one Jets drive about him. And then you have those two tackles. Uh, so I think if you're in the area of any of those two guys, you come down and, and you make your move and you go get it. But what I'm going to do is um, there's a couple guys on the board here that in this next area, 10, 11, 12, 13, 
make some sense for, you know, uh, the, the, make some sense. And, and the guy I'm really looking at now is I'm looking at Leatu Latu. All right. This is kind of, I think, the, the, the comfort zone or the comfort area where he comes up, comes off the board. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to make a trade with the New York Jets. And they're not going to let me do it. And I'm going to go down to 16. And, and I'm going to just going to say I don't have the draft in front of me, but we'll say we're going to we're going to accumulate another second round pick here. And we're going to throw them back uh, one of these two and make that. I mean, we're going to take one of these and we're going to throw them back this. And that's going to be the deal. They're going to gain some more capital and they're going to go down to 16. And the Rams are going to come up on the board for exactly who I said, Leatu Latu. Um, he, he's a guy that he can fit just about any scheme. I like him um, in, in a in a very aggressive kind of style that the LA could LA could run on him. You put him, you know, uh, pressuring the quarterback with the likes of Aaron Donald and with the likes of some of the guys they took last year. They spent some time, you know, on, on the front seven on the defense last year. Um, this to me is, is a is a fit and, and a match made in heaven. So Leatu Latu, arguably. Um, the best edge rusher in this class comes off the board to the LA Rams, who have are, are always in seems like always in need of guys like this. They keep them, they let them go, and they they flourish elsewhere. I.e., you know, Leonard Floyd and, and so on and so forth. So, Leatu yeah, Latu is a pick. Yeah, I like that a lot, and that's kind of crushing, kind of like how I crushed the dreams of Jets fans before. I, you kind of crush. I, I wouldn't say crush. There's so many things that the Buccaneers need, but yeah. that would have been my pick if he fell at number two. Yeah, and that's and that's exactly why I wanted to trade up in that spot. Yeah. Like I said, I kind of hone in on on the Bucks and Leatu Latu, another good fit there. So yeah, the, the the Rams went and got their guy though. So you're on the clock. I think you know with Tampa, it's interesting. I I have never in 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 a a mock so far throughout the regular season. I haven't even considered giving a quarterback to Tampa Bay because. Time and time again this season, it seems like Baker Mayfield is less of the problem in Tampa than anything else. Yep. On the defensive side, besides for the first three weeks of the season, there's been very little pressure. There's been horrible play in the secondary as well. I would love, you know, it's it's tough. Though There's two players screaming right now on the board to me. That's Kool-Aid McKinstry. That's Jared Verse. It's, it's a toss-up for me here. I think that the edge class – after the first round gets a little bit weaker than the cornerback class. I agree. And I, and I think that that I'm going to have to get Jared verse here for them. Uh, you know, I thought last year, speaking of, of guys like Olaf Ashanu, who were prospects last year, I thought verse was a fringe first round guy last year. He came back, you know, statistically he didn't really put up the same numbers, but I thought that he improved from, you know, certain aspects of his game. I think this warrants a top 10 pick and it, it's a big, it's a big need for the for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. I think you get Jared Verse in there. I, I I would love to get Cooley McKinstry, but I think Edge takes a little bit more precedent than the secondary right here. Well, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly in the fact that they're the the Edge group as a whole. Although there's there's a lot of guys I like in this area, Verse being one of them. Yeah. Um, it kind of falls off a cliff after say you know 45 the top 45 top 50 yeah it it then falls off a cliff so um if you're going to go get a guy uh if if edge is where you're honing in on you know you, you go get him now like i said jared versus a great you know I, I think he's a scheme fit in anywhere you put him right mm -hmm. uh, you know he can he, he doesn't matter if it's an odd front doesn't matter if even front um what he can do you know, he turns speed to power. I mean, he's as strong as an ox. A little bit older of a prospect, but, you know, yeah. we know that in, in Jermaine Johnson, and it worked out well, right? Second year. And he's, Will he's McDonald. Really up, and Will McDonald, exactly. So, um, yeah, I like Jared Verse as a prospect, and um, I, I agree that I'm pretty sure they're they're pissed off that the Rams traded up to get Latu, but <laughs> so be it. And, and that leaves me on the clock with the Raiders. Again, Raiders are in a whole – different stratosphere here right because we don't know who's going to be their coach is antonio pierce coming back right we don't know what's going on with a lot are, are they going to keep or, or are they going to trade Devonte adams you know there are so many holes in this defense you can take a dart and throw it at a dartboard and whatever positional group it lands you can by far improve on that um 
on that's so funny that you ball. say that. I said that in a video last night. I literally said I was like, you could throw throw a dart at a dartboard with the with the depth chart on, and you could just improve upon any position. Yeah, in, in that, I I I'm tempted to go quarterback here because I know that that um, Jimmy Garoppolo ain't it, and I think. The Raiders know Jimmy Garoppolo ain't it. Um, you know, full disclosure and full transparency. I'm not sure what his salary looks like, if they can get out of it easily or not, or if they're stuck on it. You know, they they seem to have liked what the Purdue kid, Aiden O'Connell, has has done. Mm-hmm. You know, to me, I don't know if he's true starting quarterback. Um, but after the three quarterbacks that are off the board, um, I'm not one who's super comfortable with a guy like Knicks or a guy like um, Penix to come in and, and, and be the, you know, franchise savior. So, so I'm going to hold off on taking a quarterback and I'm going to go ahead and address the defensive side of the ball. Um, And this is another positional group where I think is, is I hate to use the word bad, but I think as a whole, it's pretty bad. It's, you know, there's a couple guys that I like, and then it falls off a cliff. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and get them the best three tech in the, in the class and Johnny yes. Newton and Johnny Newton. Um, yes. Listen, he can, you, you know what he can do up front. You know, he, he's just quick. You know, he it looks like he's got springs in his hips and his legs and, and the way he can just get off the ball and fire out um, pushing the pocket vertical. You can even put him outside in some sets um, and have him rush from the outside, you know, if, if you went in a, in a bigger power set. Um, I like the idea of him lining up with next to Max Crosby and playing a lot of games, a lot of those stunts and those twists. It just gives one more, it, it gives somebody that needs attention so that Max Crosby isn't getting double teamed the whole time. Johnny Newton is hands down the best defensive lineman in this class. Like I said, there's a couple guys that I like. Other than that, and then it just falls off a complete cliff. So, um, yeah, the Raiders fans, you know, get at me in the comments. I get it. I know you guys want a quarterback. Uh, to me, I think the the value of Newton was much more uh, important. The value of Newton was much more higher than than bringing in a you know taking a dart throw at a quarterback who you might be able to fill in in later rounds. So, Johnny Newton, you're you were an Oakland Raider or Las Vegas Raider, excuse me. Yeah, I've been I've been pretty steadfast in my thought process saying that Johnny Newton is the best defensive player in this entire draft class. I've been saying that for months. I think he's a, the next great three tech in the NFL and you don't get mm-hmm. from what he could bring from a pass rushing side as well. I mean his his run defending is so good that you kind of forget how good of a of a pass rusher he is yeah. and I think that he's that next great three tech. I love that yeah. pick there. He's a and, disruptor, uh, man. He he, he yeah. disrupts. He he just disrupts the game. And and like I said, having a guy like that that can do that from the interior now makes you shift some of your your pass protections away, and it's going to kind of give Max Crosby a little bit more of a some room to operate. So, one hundred percent, that'll probably make Tyree Wilson a little bit better too. But uh, moving on, twelve here. You know, the Chargers for me, it, it, it's it's pretty simple. I I don't think that they believe that Cooley McKinstry would be on the board at this point. And I got to take him. I got to take Cooley McKinstry here. He's just, you know, for a team that plays, I'd say like 55, 45 in terms of, of zone and man, it's a mm-hmm. little bit more zone oriented than man. You, you get Cooley McKinstry, who's not only one of the best zone corners in the class and understanding that Nick Saban cover seven is something that you, you need a day to really dive into that and kind of understand what the heck is going on there. But McKinstry is the best communicator in the secondary of this entire draft class. He's someone that's going to lead your defense from a secondary standpoint, and that's something that you don't see too often. And they just desperately need help in the secondary. J.C. Jackson was a disaster. They cut ties with him. You just got to go start fresh at the position. I know there's a lot of other positional groups that need help there, but there's no tight end that I'm willing to take this high if it wasn't Brock Bowers. You know, running back, same deal. Wide receiver, I think we could hold off until maybe the the mid rounds for the, for the Chargers, and you know, this is just the best option right now for them. Yeah, I, listen, I I agree. I think Kool Aid is a, it, it, I mean, he's a phenomenal player. Um, he's not my number one. T- he's not, not my, one, not my mm-hmm. number one corner in the class, but but I yeah. understand the rationale. Um, I, I think he's more 
fit to play, you know, l- listen, I don't, I, I don't necessarily think Kool-Aid McKinstry would be the best corner. If you line him up, press man all the, all the time. Um, mm-hmm. I like his instincts, the way he breaks on a ball. He, he's kind of better fit in, in, in more of a zone scheme than, than a man scheme. Great yeah. player. I love Kool-Aid McKinstry. Um, and, and I agree. You, you the Chargers got to fix this defense, right? You have a defensive head coach for Christ's sakes, fix the defense. <laughs> oh, he's and, not going to be there much longer. Yeah, right? I, I can't. I can't imagine that. And um, and that leaves me up here with the Broncos. So, the Broncos is interesting. All right. Um, I think left tackle is a bigger need than than um a lot of Denver fans are talking about. Um, you know, there's the listen. They're going to make some changes in the in the wide receiver room too. I can't imagine that they're going to roll it back with the same guys. Um, so a guy like Roma Dunze does make sense, but I'm going to shy away. And, and, and like I said, I'm going to take JC Latham here for Denver. Um, and why I'm taking Latham is I think that he has, I mean, first off, he's the str- hands down the strongest offensive lineman in this class bar none. Okay. Yeah. Now they paid a lot of money to Mike McGlinchey last year. You know, he, to me, he's kind of set in his ways and, and, and meaning set in Denver, set in their ways. And he's probably going to play right tackle for them. I think Latham can transition to the left side. I don't know why he didn't play left tackle this year for Alabama, but I think he's got um, enough chops and, and, and his footwork is good enough um, that he can transition. And of the kind of higher end offensive linemen that are left, I think um, he's probably one that can move and, and play left side comfortably. Um, he's a absolute monster against the run he just moves people and, and like i said for a guy who's upwards of 350 pounds he you know he he gets out in space and he moves in space very well uh, i think he'll be able to handle the left side of the line and at worst you know um all right you have a guy that you know can come in and replace mcglinchy after next year when you can get out of him um kind of rent free so uh, jc latham and an offensive line for me makes the most sense for Denver. So he's going to be the pick. Yeah, I, I like I like that. I've I've done that a few times as well in previous mocks. It just makes the most sense to me, especially with Garrett Bowles, you know, you know, being as old as he is. I think he's a free yeah. agent this year, too. Uh 14 for the Bills. A lot of a lot of ways that I really want to go. You can offensive go a, line. a ton of different ways here. Yeah, offensive line is a bigger issue than people give her credit for. Same thing with the defensive line for the Bills as well. Yeah. Yeah. Um, secondary is big. Secondary is a really big, big talking point too, especially from the safety position. But with Romo Dunze on the board, man, I, I can't shy away from from taking him. I we don't know what's going on with Stephon Diggs after this year. I assume that Gabriel Davis is not going to be back. He's probably going to command too much money in free agency. Yeah. And then that leaves you essentially with Khalil Shakur as your wide receiver one if something happens to Stefan Diggs. So you need to nip that in the butt as soon as you can. Now, Dunze for me is someone I just love. I love watching him as a technician down the field. Mm-hmm. And for someone that doesn't have blow away speed, he really creates some massive separation. I, yeah. I do love watching him play. And I think that this would be Josh Allen's best friend on the offense absolutely listen i love uh, i like odunze as well i have him square up at the top of my board as it stands right now like right up there with neighbors under under harrison you know you can say that they're 2a and 2b um i love how he wins at all three levels of the field Mm -hmm. um you know he's a pure hands catcher um he's going he's going to do wonders in that offense where he doesn't have to be the focal point where he can just you know come in and, and do him now listen the reality is is that a, there's a couple things here. I don't think Buffalo is going to be picking this high. I think they're going to win out or, you know, yeah. come close to win now. So, you know, for this exercise, they're at 14. I don't think they're going to end up being at 14. Um, but if you look forward, you know, they're starting to come into a little bit of salary cap hell, you mm-hmm. know, Buffalo. The, 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 the Buffalo kind of powerhouse that we've seen over the past few years might start to crumble. Their defense is going to be in shambles. They're they're yeah. committed and they're pot committed and have so much money tied into Von Miller, right? Um they paid Ed Oliver and that's it, guys. That's it. You know, Floyd is a free agent. Epines is a free agent. Both safeties are over 30. I don't know what their contractual situations are. Um I think Micah Hyde's in his last year. Um they brought back Poyer. I don't know if that was a one or a two year deal. Um, I think it's a two. So you're looking at 
a pretty barren secondary after. I will say, I agree with you. If they if they went out and they're more towards the you know 25, 26, yeah. that's an easy spot for me for Cameron Kinchins. I mean, that's like a match made in heaven for me. Yeah, I've that's been I I've been mocking the guy I think is a great fit, and and I get a lot of heat from Buffalo fans for it. I think Cooper DeGene just makes complete sense over there, right? He's yeah. going to, you know, he can transition. He can play safety. If you need him to bump outside to fill that, that cornerback too, he can, you know, he can play big nickel, the role that they had Taylor Rapp doing this year. Mm-hmm. Um, it, Good fit. But yeah, like I said, I get it. Roma Dunze at this point in this offense where the team that's in need of a wide receiver too, just makes complete sense. Um, And that leaves me with Seattle. Um, So, I've stuck. I've stuck with this idea for a while, um, and I'm going to stick with it again. I think there's a there's a there's a ton of there's a slew of different ways that Seattle can go here. You know, the interior of the offensive line. Um, you know, I, Leonard Williams is is in his walk year. Do they bring him back? Right. You know, so you could use kind of that. You know, interior slash five tech big defensive lineman. Um, they're always in need of more pass rush. I mean. Yeah, the defensive back. I mean, who knows if Jamal Adams is going to be there next year? So there's a ton of different ways that make sense for Seattle. I'm going to veer off, and here is where I'm going to take Bo Nix. Yeah, I like that. Bo, Bo, listen, we don't know. Gino's under contract at least for one more year. I know his contract originally was three years, 60 or something like that. Um, you know, there, he's going to probably be the quarterback, but you know, he's getting up there in year, he's getting up there in age. This year has not been what last year was. Again, they're a team that's kind of built to sustain. You know, they want to run the ball first, you know, first and foremost. Um, They want to run the ball. They want to, um, yeah, they're they're built to last. Their their team is young. They they just bring these pipeline guys in here. Um, Now's a perfect time. You're not going to pick this high where you can get a a guy like Bonex. Listen, I personally don't think Bonex is, is, you know, plug and play, step in ready. And what better way to kind of just sit and learn behind a guy in Geno Smith who had to sit and learn how to be an NFL quarterback, right? right. You know, he offers much more mobility than Geno Smith. Um, you know, uh, he, I think he can, you know, make, although he doesn't have a, a, a howitzer on his arm like some of these other guys, I think he can make just about any throw um, on the field. Uh, for me, this is the perfect situation. You bring in a 23-year-old Bo Nix, kind of at home. You know, he, yeah, he's Pacific familiar, he's familiar with the absolutely. Pacific Northwest. He'll be a fan favorite up there. Kind of just sit and learn and be ready to hand over and transition the reins when they're still going to have two really good offensive tackles, two really good running backs in, in Bay. So the transition to go from Geno, whether it's next year or the year after, to Bo Nix makes a lot of sense. Um Bo Nix is the pick. I love it. I really do. Uh, I've made that pick a bunch of times before, and especially on Twitter. Seattle fans aren't really that thrilled about it, but it just makes too much sense. You, you know, I, I agree with basically everything that you said. He's someone that, you know, don't forget that the three-year $105 million deal that Geno Smith signed, 51 of it is gone after this year. So I think the yeah. Seattle Seahawks knew exactly what they were doing. They were going to squeeze as much as they could out of Geno Smith for the good years. And then once, I mean, his, his play is definitely tapered off from last year. There's no denying that I, you know, now this is where you make the move. You have most of the money invested in your, in your quarterback gone after this year, you still have enough to justify him starting over that rookie. And then after the second year, you cut him or trade him, whatever it may be. And Bo Nix is more than ready to take the reins. So I think Mm -hmm. Seattle has really played this perfectly. And I I love that pick 16, the jets. I'm going to trade down. I'm just kidding. Uh, we're going <laughs> to, we're, we're going to stick and pick this time. No brainer here. We're going to Lisi Fuaga on this one. Best offensive lineman left on the board. And, and the jets just, I mean, really outside of center, it's just, you could kind of upgrade on every single position in the offensive line. And I mean, I don't really, <laughs> Jets fans don't really need an explanation for that one. <laughs> yeah. Now, do you think Talisi sticks at tackle or do you think he's better, he better put inside at the next level? I think it depends on what the Jets want to do. If the Jets want to go back to being like a run first team or attempt to be a run first team, I think you kind of kick him at guard and you, and you let him pull for mm-hmm. his athleticism. He's one of the most athletic tackles I've ever seen. So it just makes sense that he'd, he'd be an athletic guard. But 
with Aaron Rodgers, I think you have to protect the outside. I think I think he's he's going to play tackle. If if this is the pick and Aaron Rodgers is healthy, ready to go, and he wants to lead the offense, you know, predominantly passing, you're going to have to leave him probably on that right side. I would say. Yeah, I, I'd agree. Um, I'd agree with that. I think he's. Uh, I, I, I listen. I think he can be an all world guard. Yeah. But I think he'll be a very very serviceable tackle. And and listen, you can you bring a guy in like Talisi Fuaga and you line him up next to AVT, you know, as long as AVT can stay healthy because he hasn't shown that in the past couple of years. So yeah, let, let's hope that that's all behind him. And then you just figure it out and, and you say, okay, one of you guys is going to be my right guard. One of you guys is going to be my right tackle. And you don't have to worry about the right side of the line for a while, right? Yeah. You got Joe Tittman. You got, even though I think Joe Tittman is probably better suited at right guard and center, but that's just my opinion. Especially um, for his size. Yeah. I, I think yeah. he just moves, you know, he, he does better in the run game. You know, you, on the you're, wasting, and you're wasting six foot six, 315 pounds at the center position. Yeah. But you bring in a guy like Fuaga and, and you say, all right, Fuaga and AVT, one is my right tackle, one is my right guard. And, and you, you fix the left side, you fix the left tackle, whether it's you re sign Makai back then, you know, short term, long term, you know, you, you, you go out and, you know, kind of poke and prod around the, the trade market. As long as it's not David Bakhtiari, I'm, I'm fine. <sighs> yeah, I agree <laughs> but, with you on that. So I'm up here for Cincinnati. Cincinnati is an interesting in an interesting spot. Um, I've been mocking them to Lisi Fuaga since you know since the get go. I think he he would be probably your your Jonah Williams replacement. Um, he's obviously off the board. I don't know. If, there's a lot of tackles I think that I like. Um, I happen to be a big fan of uh, Jordan Morgan, and I think this might be a little bit too rich, probably a little bit too rich for Marius Mims, even though I think he goes back to school. So, so I'm going to kind of pivot, and I'm going to assume now that the Burrow contract's kicking in that they're probably not going to retain both T. Higgins and Tyler Boyd. You know, so so a replacement's going to be needed, and for me, there's just you know yeah. a, a perfect replacement for yeah. T. Higgins, your true X and Keon Coleman. Um, Catch radius, 50-50 ability, um, strong hands. Even, you know, I, I think he had like a 2.8 drop rate, a 2.8% drop rate, which is, you know, incre or increased a lot. He, you know, had a case of the dropsies, you know, in the past. Um, still, still learning. A guy that big shouldn't move that as well as he does. Um, and, and it's just a natural fit. Like, just keep a, a good offense churning. And you bring in Keon Coleman and, you know, you, you wish T Higgins the best of luck, you know, wherever he signs next. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that if there was a uh, more likely of the two being re-signed, it would probably be Tyler Boyd because, you know, cheaper option mm -hmm. or a slot, a slot guy, you get Keon Coleman to replace T Higgins. That's pretty much from a, from a size standpoint, that's like a like for like change right there. You're not losing anything yeah. going from T Higgins to, to Keon Coleman. I, I love that pick. Pittsburgh is just like, I mean, there's so many. I feel like I say this every single pick, but I there's so many ways I want to go with this one. The 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 devil in me wants to go with a quarterback, but I'm not going to. Ooh. <laughs> I, I really want to go with Michael Penix Jr. here, but I think I'm gonna hold off. Uh corner in general is a position that probably could use an upgrade. Yeah, And I love Nate Wiggins here, but I think there's a player that is a little bit more versatile that could kind of fit Pittsburgh a little bit better. It's going to be Cooper DeGene for me here. Mm. I think DeGene is someone that could kind of fill that role. You look at Minka Fitzpatrick and, and really, I mean, Joey Porter Jr. hasn't been on the field consistently every single snap, but he's really the only playmaker in the secondary. You need someone that could just, you know, make plays he's versatile he could play he could play corner like you said before he could play safety he could even return punts he could return kicks as well i love that added little aspect of his game as well i, I think he kind of fits he goes from black and gold black and yellow to black and gold essentially mm -hmm. from iowa to pittsburgh I, I think he fits exactly what the pittsburgh Steelers kind of sort of need in this first round i was thinking wide receiver as well Emeka abuka is someone that speaks out to me in pittsburgh as well but i think i just got to go with the safe pick here and take dejean yeah, uh, listen, it, 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 he DeGene can kind of come in, and he makes a, a lot of sense for a team that 
like Pittsburgh, you know, you can pair him up in split safeties with Minka and you mm-hmm. can alternate who, you know, who's playing the deep middle and who's up in the box or vice versa, or even more so, you you know, uh, the gene can pop outside in certain situations. He can cover the slot in certain, cer- certain situations exactly. without fail. I mean, he's like a, you know, a Swiss army knife and Pittsburgh's going to love a guy like Cooper DeGene. Absolutely. So that leaves me on the clock with Atlanta. And this could be realistically the spot Michael Penix come off, but I'm going to, I'm, I'm not going to take Michael Penix. Um, and I'm going to address the opposite side of the ball, right? Um, the defense is still needs uh, a little something. Oh, God, I don't know, man. I, I'm back and forth on this, uh, on this selection. I think I'm going to just stick to my guns and stick. There's two guys that I've been, actually there's three guys that I've been rotating in and, and I can't determine which makes the most sense. You can get another pass rusher and a, and a you know uh, an athletic twitchy guy like Chop Robinson, which I think he can make sense. You know, uh, opposite Arnold Epichetti for Atlanta and really affect the pass rush there. Um, I also like a guy like Braylon Trice. You know, they yeah. need some beef and a guy that can you know push and and it's more and, Ryan Nielsen's defense too, exactly that, that, the that big that big beef type. Type. But I'm gonna shy away from both of them. And I'm going to pair up Nate Wiggins with AJ Terrell and just oh, lock, like and just lock lock down the cleansing oh, cornerback duo. I like that. He's he's fits the scheme. Like I said, uh, he, you know he can get up there and he can you know get up and press. He does. You know he has enough you know wherewithal and and enough you know uh, smart football IQ that he can play in all. He can play off man. He can play in a cover three at times. You know, they did a lot. They've been playing a lot more zone, a lot more cover four this year. I think Nate Wiggins can do that, but now you just lock up that, that defensive backfield. You got two decent safeties back there. One, you paid a lot of money for, um, and you just bring Nate Wiggins and AJ Terrell and, and have them lock up at the outside and kind of in the mold. And, and I'm not doing it because of the jets, but very similar. You get guys on the outside that can cover, you're going to create pressure up front. So yes. Nate Wiggins to, to Atlanta is going to be the pick. Yeah, I like that a lot. And, and you're right. I, I feel like Trice is someone that could fit, but that's really just an Ebicady role right there. You're looking at is, is really what Braylon Trice would kind of fill. Yeah. Um, Dallas Turner is a really nice option there, but he doesn't fit really what Nielsen's looking for. I just pair Nate Wiggins with AJ Terrell is, is a prospect that I didn't even really think about up until just now. So that's that's an awesome pick right there. I like that. Green Bay is interesting. Um, every time that we think that Green Bay is going to do something, they do the opposite yeah. of, of what we think. So I'm going to try and think of the opposite here. So <laughs> what would what would be number one? Got to be tackle. Tackle. Yeah. Got to be tackle. So I'm not going to do that. So <laughs> I'm going to address the secondary here, and I'm going to take Cameron Kitchens. And – Cameron Kitchens is, if you haven't watched him play the safety position at Miami, I'll put it to you this way. It's a joy. First off, Cameron Kitchens and James Williams together is like one of the my favorite safety duos of all time in college. Mm-hmm. Watching those guys play, tremendous. I mean, you got an inc- incredible size combination between Kitchens, who's 6'1", 210. You got James Williams, who's 6'5", 215. From the safety position, insane. Those guys are incredible. I hope James Williams comes out this year, but if he goes back and plays one more year, I, I think he's going to be. I my think he announced. One. He announced yeah. James Williams announced for the draft, so he's definitely oh, coming out. Thank God! Thank God! Yeah. Uh, Kitchens happy. hasn't. I don't think he's a senior, and I don't think he's. I don't. I don't think he's. Um, you know, announced that he's coming out. I yeah, could be I wrong, mean, it would make the most sense for me. It would make the most sense after the back-to-back seasons he's put together. Why yeah. risk going back and and having a drop off and play? He's he's phenomenal. I, I think that this would really solve some of the issues that the back Packers have in the back end of their secondary. Not to mention, pretty much every single safety on the roster is a free agent coming up. So yeah. you're not going to retain everyone. This is also someone that could come down and play sub package linebacker as well. It with his size. He's just just a, a, a big time, you used the term before, big time Swiss Army knife that you could kind of put everywhere in, in in that secondary. And I think that this would be a great pick. Like I said, I'm just trying to think of the opposite of what green bay would do because every time we're like wide receiver or tackle it's always something else and don't and look at the success that the green bay packers have had drafting in the second round and later when it comes to you know offensive linemen Mm -hmm. you're looking at you know 
what John Runyon Jr., Zach yeah. Tom. Zach Tom was a yeah. fourth rounder, Elton, right? Elton Jenkins was a second round pick. Like, let's let's pump the brakes here on taking a tackle round one. Let's get a incredible playmaker for the back end of your secondary. And on top of it, Green Bay currently owns the Jets second round pick, which you know is going to be in the top of the round. Exactly. So, you know, the 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 fall off from a tackle that you might take at 20 is the drop off isn't going to be that much worse at 40, you know, depending on how they have them rated and so on and so forth. You know, <clears throat> so so I agree with that. I, I like the the rationale. I think everyone just auto, you know, auto clicks Green Bay, tackle the Green Bay, and mm-hmm. uh, it makes sense. Now, Kitchens, I, I will say this about him, man. I'm not comparing the two because I don't think there's any comparison to the this former all pro, all world safety. But Kitchens, his ball skills reminds me so much of Ed Reed. Yep. So much of Ed yep. Reed, man. Yep. You know, um, I think he's going to be a really, a really, really good player in the league. And, and that leaves me up with the Vikings here. Um, and listen, the Vikings defense has, has kind of impressed me, but, I, but I think there's, you know, listen, there's still some work to do on the, in the defensive backfield for, for that team. You know, I, I still think you need to put in some, some true, um, press man to man coverage. If, um, you know, they're going to blitz as much as they want to blitz, um, you know, you're going to need some edge. You're going to need some Ed Hill. Minnesota's in a weird spot, right? And the weirdest spot is that Kirk, Coven, Kirk Cousins was a great quarterback for Minnesota. We don't know if Kirk Cousins, Cousins coming back. All right. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to bring a quarterback in. It's not going to be Michael Penix. I'm taking J.J. McCarthy. Now, people either love J.J. McCarthy or they don't love J.J. McCarthy. OK, and here's my rationale. I don't know if J.J. McCarthy can come in and, and lead the Minnesota offense right away. I think he's, you know, he's got the build. He's got the maturity. He's got enough arm strength. I think he's a perfect West Coast quarterback or West Coast scheme quarterback. My assumption here is that they bring Kurt back on another short term deal. Kind of let him run the offense now. Let J.J. McCarthy um, work. I thought about trading down here. Um, and, and taking JJ McCarthy later in the round, but, um, the video is getting long enough. So I figured I just, <laughs> I just pull the trigger more. So this is not a knock on Michael Penix. And this is just my opinion. Uh, Michael Penix is, a, I think he's a really good quarterback. Michael Penix had two ACL. Michael Penix had a torn AC joint in one shoulder and a separation of the other one. Those are real injuries. That's real stuff. The flags are going to be different. I don't think Michael Penix goes in the first round because of all those medical flags. Listen, I'm not going to lie. If the Jets trade back and they get some draft capital Mm -hmm. and, you know, once I feel like once a quarterback slips past the Vikings, you're really looking at a lot of teams. Everyone really does not need a quarterback after that. So I think that there would be a mad scramble for this 22, this number 22 overall pick. Mm-hmm. possibly because you know the cardinals are not shy about trading down so i think that that would be in play i'm not going to do that here because now we're looking at probably the team that i would say would trade up from a second round spot to number 22 would probably be someone maybe like tampa who is hey like we just you know but that's kind of too far and and you know we're, we're we're projecting some crazy stuff here so i'm gonna hold but that at 22 i feel like this it, you know, it's between two players for me. One fits the scheme just a little bit better than the other, but man, I got to take Dallas Turner here, man. I I, yeah. I have to. It just he, it just makes too much sense. I know that Trice would probably fit that multiple front that Gannon likes to run a little bit better, but Dallas Turner could be Jonathan Gannon's Hassan Reddick. Like you you know what I'm saying? It 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 just seems like a perfect fit on paper. So if you could escape the first round, <laughs> Marvin Harrison, Jr. Dallas Turner, if you're the Arizona Cardinals, I mean, pff, that's amazing. Yeah. Th- the way, the way this first round mock fell for us, like I- I'm shocked that Dallas Turner is still on the board there. They're in, in all reality people, there's a good chance he's off the board in the top 10. You know, yeah. it, it wouldn't surprise me one bit. Um, yeah. The, the, the flexibility that he has, um, in terms of even dropping off the ball and, 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 you know, dropping back in zone coverage, getting at the quarterback. Um, God, it, it, this is a home run draft right now for the Cardinals in, yeah. in just two picks. 
And that leaves me here on the board for the Colts. Um, I know what I'm going to do. And this is probably kind of boring. But <laughs> um, listen, yeah, I'm going to stick with I'm, I'm going to stick with my guns here. Um, might be a little bit of a reach. All right. But I'm thinking about the offensive side of the board. You got Anthony Richardson, right? You got Anthony Richardson. Now you got a running back in in place for how long? I don't know how long they signed Taylor for. But I think it was three or four years. Yeah. I think. So, so he's there, right? Um, you have an offense that, you know, you have a quarterback who's got a bazooka for an arm, right? You know, they're going to be kind of run first RPO based or, or whatever um, Steichen's going to want to do with them first. Um, your, your number one, your X receiver is not under contract yet. Although I think he stays. Okay. Yeah. You have a nice slot piece in Josh Downs, and and now you need that Z. You need that guy who can go and move, who can stretch the field at times. Um, you know, to kind of opposite, you know, kind of the counterbalance what Pittman does on his side. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to get a guy that I think where is going to reach the first round in that mold, and that's Brian Thomas at LSU. 6'4", you know, go get it. You you talk about a guy who can go, right? That, to me, is, is Brian Thomas. Now, everyone thinks that he's going to be a, a pure X at the next level. I don't see it. I think the guy does enough with the ball in his hand. I think he can run, run by guys. I think he runs good enough routes that he's not going to be stuck just being your prototypical possession guy. Brian Thomas is a home run hitter. You know, in a really, really big body. And you put a home run hitter who can go and outrun guys, pass with a with a quarterback like Anthony Richardson. You know, you still have the underneath jitterbug in Josh Downs. You still have old reliable um man in the outside and your possession guy in Pittman. Like this offense just stepped its game up a level. So Brian Thomas oh, is a man. pick for me. Killing me over here. That was gonna be my pick for Houston. Oh, was it? <laughs> wow, killing me over here. Now, honestly, I'm thinking about going a different direction here with this. Mm -hmm. So I love that pick, by the way. I think that makes a lot of sense, like 100% a lot of sense. And, you know, I, the only prospect for me thinking about Brian Thomas Jr. on Houston is you have two six foot four wide receivers that could stretch the field and Nico Collins and Brett, Brett, like that would just be a yeah. nightmare for any situation. Yeah. So with that, think Dell doing his work underneath. Man. Yeah. Like that's just a nightmare situation for any team. Yeah. So I was thinking that that would be like insane, but you know, maybe you feel the same way. The one team that I've struggled with all season long to kind of find a perfect fit at any spot that they're at, they're at is Houston mm -hmm. because Houston to me doesn't have glaring needs. They really don't like, I, I mean, their offensive line could use some work. I'd, I'd probably consider taking a tackle here. I'm not going to take Amarius Mims. Only reason why is because I feel like he's going to go return to Georgia. So I'd probably yeah. leave him out. Yeah. Um, Agreed. You need some versatility on the offensive line for sure. You want to protect CJ Stroud, your number one asset. Tight end is something I'm willing to look at at 24. I am linebacker. Uh, not really looking forward, not really looking towards it here. Leonard Taylor could be in play for me here, but I kind of like what the interior of the defensive line has done for Houston so far this year. I'm going to hold off on that. And I think I'm going to go bold, maybe a reach, maybe not. I'm going to take Jatavion Sanders here at number 24. Uh, just another, you know, premium athletic weapon for CJ Stroud. He hasn't put it all together as a tight end. I think you're looking at more of the Kyle Pitts archetype where he's more of an athlete, more of a, a, a bigger slot receiver really than, than anything. But if he could put it all together, I think that this would be, first off, a mean 12 personnel between Dalton Schultz and Jadavion Sanders. Yeah. That would be unreal. I, I know it, it's a little bit outside of the box, but you're essentially getting another weapon with some serious upside for this type of offense for Houston. Yeah. Um, I don't think it's, out of the out of question. Um, I mean, Houston obviously is one of those teams that needs a tight end. Um, I'm not sure I have Jatavian Sanders uh, as as a high, this high. Um, and I'm not saying he's not worth it. Uh, I, I just think that if it was me picking, like you said, 
there's a lot of different ways where I think the value might kind of match a little bit more than Jatavian Sanders. Uh, again, not, not knocking your pick. I like it. I, uh, this is to me is another, another area where um, you get one of those guys that want to trade up from the second round early in the second round to go get a quarterback, a Penix or McCarthy, whoever's on the board. Yeah. You know, Houston can make sense dropping down and then, you know, and, and sit there. But Jatavian Sanders is a really, really good football player. And, and, you know, Houston has, sneakily built up a really, really nice offense, right? Yeah. And, and that's just another weapon for him. So um, I'm on the board here with Kansas City. I know everyone's going to say, go get a big wide receiver. That's what they need. I'm going to shy away. All right. I'm just going to play different. Like I, I, I'm i tired of of um, locking in Xavier Leggett or, or A.D. Mitchell to Kansas City. Um, and, and to me, I'm going to probably – stay on the defensive side of the ball. Wow. I'm going to, I'm going to take Braylon Trice wow. and, and I'm going to knock put Braylon Trice in there opposite of George Karloftis. And um, listen, there, there needs to be some, some defensive line, um, some fresh legs on this defensive line. Braylon Trice, I think is it, it, people are sleeping on him. I, I know that Washington UW got a lot of hype this year for what they did on the offense. But if you watch Braylon Trice, I mean, he plays, like his ass is on fire. He's a bull in a china shop. You know, he he's got the strongest bull rush um of any defensive line prospect, I think, in this class. Um, and then you watched him develop a counter and a and a secondary move this year. Um, and he just makes a mess for those he makes a mess for the quarterbacks. I love the idea of popping him on one side and having Carl Loftus on the other side, both guys you know, are, are, are good, you know, good with their hands, good power. They can seal the edge. Um, it opens up a lot more things that you can do on the defensive side of the ball. If you have a guy like Braylon Trice in there. Um, so Braylon Trice can be my pick to Kansas city. Yeah. I, you know what, Dom, you, you really, these next few picks, I mean, these, these three or, or four, I'd say from Brian Thomas to the pick that I'm going to have right now, mm -hmm. I don't think anyone's ready for him. I think, I think, <laughs> I think we've done, I think we've done a really good job of kind of switching it up here at 26. I got to be honest with you. Uh, another team that just really doesn't have too many glaring needs. Sure. Secondary could be upgraded a little bit. Uh, defensive line, I think could defensive line itself, not necessarily edge could use a really big upgrade here, especially, I mean, Josh Allen kind of does it alone right now. You know, Trayvon Walker, we kind of knew was a project going into being, a number one overall pick. Uh, personally, me, I wouldn't draft a uh, project as a number one overall pick. Um, defensive line for me is big here. And there's one player that I feel like hasn't gotten enough love because it's a position that doesn't get enough love that rightfully so isn't necessarily on the field all the time. But I'm going to take Tavondre Sweat with this pick at number 26 here. I, I think that there's no, there's no scientific reason behind how fast and how athletic a 6'4", 362-pound man is mm -hmm. in Devondre Sweat. I think he could just create that absolute wrecking ball from the middle of that 3-4 defense. And honestly, I wouldn't even be that opposed to playing him maybe more as a 5-tech. He's probably going to be 0, you know, 1, 2, whatever it may be. He's going to line up, uh, you know, across the, the guards in the center, probably across the face of the center. But, man, he could really create some problems in the interior there. And he he is he's a guy that is probably the most athletic 350-plus pound guy I've seen since Vince Wilfork. Yeah. Uh, and, yeah, I, I just think it would create some real problems for a lot of teams that, you, you know, Jacksonville – Jacksonville's actually had a sneaky good defense this year, I feel like. Run defending, they would be that much better. He could create from the middle of that, like like just kind of push the center back, kind of like what Vince Wilfork would do. He would just kind of forklift people right back into his quarterback's lap. The size, speed, athleticism, strength for his size just doesn't make any sense. And I think I think we need to be evaluate that a little bit more. Yeah, no, uh, the, both of the Texas tackles um, this year are, are sky high on my board. Uh, yeah. of interior guys they're so good and um listen i think I, I think you hit the nail on the head on the area where tavandre sweat's gonna end up you know yeah. i think the I, I think the world and i think the draft nation you know the the 
the real big, you know, uh, true guys who follow and 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 are already knee deep, in, you know, in their scouting and in their process know who Ronzi Sweat, and I think the rest of the world is going to kind of move up. I think he's. I like. I love the fit for Jacksonville. Um, I, I love the player even more. Uh, I think that Sweat, you know, what he can do against the run game, and for a guy that big, how he can press that the middle of the pocket or, or pressure the middle of the pocket. I mean, listen, you can't get you can't argue with it. You can't argue with the pick. I actually would have considered him also for Kansas City. He was kind of in, you know, he was kind of in the in that realm. But yeah, Jacksonville's a perfect perfect spot. That leaves me with the Cowboys. Cowboys, I think, have a couple different options. Um, I'm probably going to go a little chalk here and be a, a little bit boring. Um, yeah, I, I, I am. I'm going to take Grant Barton. Uh, to me, it just makes sense. Listen, you, you got some holes on the interior. You got some holes on the offensive line, right? Um, you know, I know you paid a lot of money to the right tackle who had a bad who had a bad season so far. You know, yeah. you, you got your guards. <clears throat> you got your right guard locked up. You don't know. You know what's going to come about of your center. You still don't know. Um, actually, they got Tyler Smith. I think you just keep him at left guard. I mean, he's been yeah, he's been phenomenal. Incredible. Yeah, he was he was incredible. one of my he was my one of my favorite linemen coming out of the draft a couple years ago. Um, you know, and then you got your, your left tackle. So could Smith? Could Tyler Smith bump over to left tackle? He could. Could Graham Barton play tackle? I I know that some of the um, people say you know, with, with his, you know, needs to put on some weight, maybe not, not the ideal arm size, but I think he can play tackle in a pinch at, at worst. You have a, a flexible chess piece to just plug and play anywhere in that interior line. Um, I like him at center. I like him at either guard. I, I like him at tackle in a pinch as well. So to me, I, I, Graham Barton is, is a guy who's going to come in. You're going to find a role for him. I think he's a good player. Um, you know, listen, not the strongest, um, not the strongest depth, you know, definitely fast. I like him, you know, in space. I like the, his movement skills in space. Um, not the strongest, not the strongest anchor could probably use to add a little bit more weight, especially if he's going to stay on the inside to deal with some of these guys like Tavondre sweat, you know, at, at 360 pounds. But, but I like Graham Barton and, and plug him wherever you want on that offensive line. Yeah. I, I, and you know, it's funny, the, the boring pick for, Dallas uh -huh. is the smart pick because the last few years you look at the boring picks that the Dallas Cowboys have made. You talk about Tyler Smith, you know what I mean? Talk about Mozzie Smith as well, who hasn't necessarily panned out yet, but he's going to get better. God bless you. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and I think Grant Barton's a great, great play there. You know, you have a lot of questions coming up about your offensive line and that's a guy that has played at what four different positions on the offensive line in his time. In, at Duke, and he's a mauler of an offensive line, too. I, I love watching him play. Very smart, very heady yep. um, offensive lineman as well. Love that. D Detroit at number 28. And, man, I got to be honest with you. I would love to take Troy Franklin here. I really would. Mm. I, I would love. But I'm going to go with the smart pick here. I'm going to take a corner because I think that's really what this defense is missing, someone that could step up and be that number one guy. But we're going to have to go down the board a little bit here for my pick. I know the number 46 right there. <laughs> you knew know exactly who I was I knew going exactly, for. Like, I knew exactly who it was. You know exactly who Man, I was what a what for. a fit here, too. I mean, yeah. just his cover skills um yeah. in Aaron Glenn's defense. Ugh. I mean, perfect. Yeah, perfect. I mean, it's just like you said, guys in the draft world have to know about this guy. He is Toledo, small school. I get it. This man is a baller. His coverage skills are incredible. His production is awesome as well. The dude is a straight up baller, and and I I I love being one of those guys that kind of like puts these fringe day one guys into the first round because it looks that much better when they actually do get drafted in the first yeah. round. But yeah, I mean Mitchell is a beast. You could argue Lassiter here as well, and even Kalen King. But I think Mitchell has them beat in terms of his coverage skills. Uh, listen, I I think he is going to, or I listen. You can make an argument. You can make an argument that he has the best pure man-to-man -man cover skills of any cornerback in this class. Now, yeah. some are going to say, "All right, he played at Toledo. I want to see what he does against the, you know, the big time." It, athletically, and just what the 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 tape that he puts out says, he deserves to be a first-round pick. Um, 
I love it. I, I mean, to me, it's a slam dunk with Detroit here as well at that at, at that position. This player at that position um, makes a ton of sense. It's a perfect scheme for him, and and he could just shine out there, man. He could just shine. Quinion yeah. Mitchell is going to be a really, really good ball player at the next level. Absolutely. So, um, I'm up with San Francisco. I'm also going to um, – I'm also going to stay on the defensive side of the ball. I think right tackle would make sense. I do. Um and I'm, I'm operating like you, just you know, full disclosure, that Amarius Mims isn't coming back. He would have probably been taken already. Um, yeah. I don't think he's coming back to school. So for lack of better, um, I'm going to leave him off. So offensive line does make sense. Um, I like Jordan Morgan a lot. Um, I think Jordan Morgan it will probably end up as a left tackle at the next level. Now, you know, you have Trent Williams there. And, and listen, you're not going to replace Trent Williams. I mean, he is the prototypical left tackle in the NFL, but he is 30 some odd years old, right? Um, the right tackle has been a problem. So tackle does make sense here. Um, but to me, I think there's a bigger hole um, and it's on the defensive side of the ball. And I'm going to also go down the board a little bit and I'm going to select Iowa state cornerback wow. TJ Tampa. Um, wow. Perfect. Perfect scheme fit. You know, uh, he is your your big, tall zone cornerback. Plays obvious Tredarius Ward over there. Um, it, just, listen, just uh, the rich get richer, right? Because I think TJ Tampa is going to be a really, really good pro. Like I said, big body, perfect fit. Line him up off. Line him up in zone coverage and just and just watch him play. Again, another guy that I think is going to be in the – it, you know, in the grumblings of this late first round, early second round, and and I'm going to pay him the uh, homage he deserves, and and have him go into a into a perfect scheme in San Francisco. I I love the the love to these guys. Another guy that I I consider probably higher than most is DJ James. Love him as well. Mm-hmm. Um, TJ Tampa here is is awesome. I love that. I really do. And at 30 here, I'm going to go with something that's probably, you know. I guess, matter of fact, at this point, I'm going to take a wide receiver. I'm going to take A.D. Mitchell at number 30 here. I think one thing that I love about Mitchell is we haven't seen his best ball yet. That's what I really when, – when I look at prospects, I had a discussion. I was actually on another show earlier today, and we were discussing quarterbacks, and, and he brought up Mac Jones. And I said one thing that I never liked about Mac Jones was that he showed his ceiling in his last year right. at Alabama. Yeah, we knew we knew exactly what he was going to be at the NFL level. Ad Mitchell was in a run first offense his first two years in Georgia. Didn't really get a chance to show exactly what he was about. He comes to Texas. He's obviously, you know, I mean, a great offense. Like you said, Xavier Worthy, Jatavion Sanders, Quinn Ewers, Jonathan Brooks. You have a lot of weapons. So, you know, it, it not all the attention is on Ad Mitchell, but man, oh man, can that guy play? He could fly. He's very competitive and a really good run blocker as well, which is what I like. And I think what Baltimore will like as well is someone that loves to, you know, they they love those wide receivers that can put people in the dirt. He's not necessarily the biggest guy you're looking at at six four. He's only two hundred pounds, so he plays with more play strength than you think that he'll have. And he's also a burner. And, and they're really looking for that big athletic wide receiver on the outside. Rashad Bateman has been pretty disappointing. That's probably the role that he'll overtake is Rashad Bateman's. Odell is on a one-year deal. Not sure if he'll come back. And, I mean, back-to-back years with a wide receiver in the first round, but you're getting Lamar Jackson. You're you're seeing what is able to happen when you give Lamar Jackson a little bit more weapons. I mean, they're a great team this year. You had A.D. Mitchell, someone that could be a red zone threat as well. I think it would be a really, really good prospect to add for the Baltimore Ravens. I was thinking Terry on Arnold or Kalen King as well, but I, I think wide receiver takes a little bit more precedent here. Yeah, no, listen, you can either way you went would have would have made sense. And especially those two cornerbacks, I think they're great fits. I think they're both slots at the next level. Mm-hmm. I think they, they both stay inside. And of those guys that stay inside outside of the gene, I think Terry on Arnold and, and Kalen King are probably the best. But listen, it, it, you've got a new offensive coordinator. You know, he's kind of opened things up. You see what Lamar can do as a passer. Um, you got to keep you, you got to keep that cupboard. You can't go, let that cupboard go bare. Right. So mm-hmm. uh, A.D. Mitchell, uh, perfect fit. I, I, you know, I don't think they bring Odell back. Um, but if you draft a guy like A.D. Mitchell, I think you're you're still in good hands. Uh, like you said, six, four, 
you know, the way he moves and, you know, he just scores touchdowns, you know, he just scores touchdowns. Um, so I love it. I, I love the, I, I love what Baltimore can do at this spot, you know? And again, I don't think, you know, when you talk about Michael Penix, you know, another perfect spot. Somebody wants to come up and get the fifth round option on, yeah. on Michael Penix. Baltimore can drop down and still land comfortably if they choose to go towards a defensive sure. backfield, towards a wide receiver spot. Um, definitely a, a spot. And I'm up here with um, Miami. So, you know, you you already took my um, my normal Miami mock at 31. I think Jatavian Sanders is a great fit for them. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen a couple different ideas. Um, listen, Toronto Armstead is can't say healthy, right? I don't know yeah. if I don't know if there's a pure plug and play left tackle here. I don't know if you need one. Maybe Toronto you, you go with Toronto Armstead and, and you draft his replacement, and that's fine. Um, that makes sense if you wanted to take a guy like Jordan Morgan or, um, you know, if you thought Troy uh, Fatano can stay at tackle, maybe you, you move him. Other than that, like, you know, Robert Hunt's on the, you know, I think Robert Hunt is a free agent, so you're going to need to replace a guard if you don't bring him back. Um, you just locked up Austin Jackson, I believe. Yes. They did lock up Austin Jackson. Yeah, so three, you got, three years. Yeah. yeah, you got your right tackle there for, for the future, which is the blind side there. Um I think some of that depth can be had later on. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to, you know, I, I thought long and hard about A.D. Mitchell's um, counterpart here to come off the board. Just think about this. I'm not going to make the pick, but just think about a Xavier Worthy in this offense, right? You have, oh you, you have Waddle. You have um, Tyreek. You have, the, you know, the guys in the backfield who are both, lightning bolts and then you add a guy like Xavier Worthy who can just stretch the field and take more time it's it's sickening and and I don't think it's that crazy but I'm not going to uh, I'm going to shy away uh, I'm going to stay on the defensive side of the ball right um uh, I don't know if the edge rusher is coming back um Phillips from the Achilles you know that mm -hmm. you know he's a guy that needs his explosion and we don't know what that's going to look like um but there's nobody here that that plays that outside linebacker role. I think Chop is, I mean, Chop's as explosive and as switchy as he gets. But but I see him kind of like, and the reason why I think he'll he's still on the board is he's got to be, a, you know, he's your true pass rush specialist. You know, put his hand on the ground, so on and so forth. That's not the yeah. kind of defense. The, he doesn't fit the mold of of the you know the the outside the odd man front that Miami runs. So I'm going to go to the backside, um, and I'm going to. Take Tyler Newbin um, and replace Deshaun Elliott. You know, you you match him up with Javon Holland on the back end. Um, Deshaun Elliott hasn't been good this year, and, and I believe he's only on a one-year deal. So you're going to need somebody that comes in. And I don't care who plays strong and who plays free, uh, but Newbin, at, at, you know, has got the chops. He's got the build at 6'2", you know, 220 two, pounds. Yeah. yeah. Um, he, can, he can handle it. I, I think he's – Another guy, another prospect that's flying under the radar. Um, you know, he hits, you know, he, he he does everything that you want on that back end. You now have uh, Javon Holland uh, running mate locked up. And listen, Miami is going to come into cap issues real soon, real quick, right? Yeah. They're dumping a lot of money right now. Um they're gonna they're gonna have some trouble. I don't know if Holland signed long term, and I'm not saying they're not going to sign him long term, but you know, you, when you're pressed up against the cap, you know, sometimes you got to make tough decisions, which is probably why Christian, why Christian Wilkins still isn't re-signed. Um, so it, at, at worst comes to worst, you know, when you bring in Tyler Newman to work alongside of Javon Holland as your strong safety or or opposite safety of Javon Holland, if something goes awry and you can't bring him back, you know that you still have a, a, a viable NFL starter. Um, to me, I think edge rusher makes sense, but I think safety here makes a lot more sense. They're, they've shown that they're not afraid to invest in the defensive backfield. They took Cam, Cam Smith last year in the first, well, with their first round, which happened to be in yeah. the second round. Um, <laughs> you know, you get, you know, so the defensive backfield in, you know, in that, you know, real pressure oriented defense makes sense. So Newbin's going to be the pick. Yeah, I like that. I really do. It's the size, and I, I hate it as a Jet fan, but <laughs> I, I, I like it. I, re I really do. And something, again, outside the box. Love that as well. 32 final pick in the first round here. 
again, this would be the spot for a team to come up yeah. and take a quarterback here. And uh, cause especially with Howie Roseman loves to trade, loves to trade down, loves to acquire assets. You know what? For the sake of it, because full transparency, I was going to be outside the box and I was going to take Xavier worthy with the 32nd overall pick, but I'm not going to do that. And the only reason why I was going to do that is because I could just imagine like the sensible pick for me there is JT to him allow, you know, mm-hmm. kind of get younger on the edge. Yeah. Um, Maybe Troy Fatanu kind of that's that's your your next interior guy of the future right there. I, I don't want to go logical here. I don't. <laughs> it was going to be Xavier Worthy, but I'm going to trade. I'm going to trade this pick to the Tampa Bay Buccaneers, and they're going to take Michael Penix Jr. Let's make I think that this, I, I I think that this is uh, I think this is this is close enough to where, like you said, this is going to be a really valuable pick in terms of trading down because of that fifth year option and. You know, if Penix is able, you know, or if the Bucks are able to re-sign Mike Evans, and you got Evans, Godwin, you know what I mean. You got Kate Otten as well, who's actually a pretty decent tight end. You got Rashad White, who can catch passes out of the backfield. You got a decent offensive line, could use some work. <laughs> I think getting Michael Penix Jr. at the end of the first round, moving up ten spots, would be a really good move for them. Yeah, listen, um, we talked about it all the way from you know. Oh, Christ, probably right around here that yeah. any team from this point on can trade right from here. From, any team can trade up if they wanted to go get Michael Penix. Um, and that, so it makes sense. You know, what do you have in, um, you know, Philadelphia can make Philadelphia can make do. Listen, I like, you know, I, I like JT Tuomau a lot to that team, but I think mm-hmm. he could still, I, I think you could still get them. They have two higher second round picks here. If, even if you got to trade up from 45 to, you know, to 35 to make it happen, you have enough capital to do so. Um, yet yeah, for me, I like the, I like the idea of Tampa Bay going up and, Just to get and a securing funky, our guy. You know what I'm saying? Just get the whole, I mean, this, this mock, not, not in a bad way. This mock took a turn. After after number twenty three, we went crazy after twenty three on this one. So, well, uh, listen, I, I don't know if we went crazy. I, I we did not go chalk. That's for that's for damn yeah. sure. You know, yeah. we stayed away from the chalk pick, but overall, like nothing, nothing too 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 crazy. All right, you want to say, you know, Quinion Mitchell or, or TJ Tampa probably aren't first round corners. You can make that argument, but uh, I I would beg to differ. I think these guys I would felt. I, I think these guys not only their skill sets, but they fell into schemes that just make sense, right? Yeah, they just make sense. So, uh, boys and girls, there's our first round mock. You got Caleb Williams to the Bears, Drake May to the Patriots, Marvin Harrison Jr. to the Cardinals, Oli Fushanu to the Redskins, Brock Bowers to the Bears. Jaden Daniels, a third quarterback off the board, the top six picks goes to the Saints. Malik Neighbors to the Giants. Joe Alt to the Titans. Liatu Latu traded the Rams traded up to get him. Jared Verse to the Bucks. Johnny Newton to the to the Raiders. Kool Aid McKinstry to the to the Chargers. J.C. Latham to Denver. Romo Dunze to the Buffalo Bills. Bo Nix, quarterback four. Off the board to the Seattle Seahawks, Talisi Fuaga um, to the Jets, who finally picked after trading down twice. <laughs> Keon Coleman to the Bengals, Cooper DeGene, Swiss Army Knife to the to the Steelers. Nate Wiggins pairs up with his Clemson buddy, AJ Terrell, and, and they lock down the Atlanta um, defensive backfield. Cam Kitchens to the to the Packers. JJ McCarthy, quarterback five off the board, the top 21 picks to the Minnesota Vikings. Dallas Turner then went to the Cardinals. Wide receiver Brian Thomas to the Colts. Tight end Jatavian Sanders goes to Houston. Defensive lineman, edge, inside, whatever you want to call him, stud from Washington. Braylon Trice goes to the Chiefs. Devondre Sweat to the Jaguars. Offensive lineman Graham Barton to the Cowboys. Defensive back from Toledo, Quinion Mitchell to the Lions. Defensive back from Iowa State, TJ Tampa to the Niners, AD Mitchell, wide receiver to the Ravens, Tyler Newbin, surprisingly, the second safety taken in the first round. Um, well, second true safety taken in the first round. I I, I beg to argue on Cooper DeGene, but uh, mm-hmm. he goes to Min- he goes to Miami, fills a hole there. And then Tampa Bay makes another appearance in the first round after trading up to lock in QB number six, Michael Penix. Yeah, listen, 
that was fun. That all made sense. I don't think there was anything too, too crazy. Um, you know, is it going to be a hundred percent accuracy? I'd beg to differ. Never is. Never is. Right. But, um, the basis and the idea and, and the rationale, I think that we made all the picks completely make sense. And, and if nothing more, I had a hell of a time. I had a, a fun time doing it too, dude. Dom, I got to do this again with you, bud. This is this was awesome, and I really, you know, fellow Jets fans, we got to stick together. We got to make the content together. You know, I, I, I just, I love talking with you, and I love doing this with you, man. Thank you Amen. for having me. I really appreciate nah, it. Nah, it's been my pleasure. And guys, um, scroll on all along the board. I'll also throw it. Um, I'll also pin it to the comment section. Um, you got the mock draft guy on YouTube at the mock draft guy on YouTube. Your Twitter page as well is. Your Twitter account is the mock draft guy. Yeah, the mock draft guy YT. The YT stands for YouTube, but in slang terms, I guess it would it stands for white. So uh, I never thought that one through. But it's well, the mock well draft you ain't guy lying. YT. You ain't lying. <laughs> Listen, um, be a lot of fun, dude. Thanks for coming on. Like I said, the, the the cycle's young. We got plenty of times. You know, whenever you're 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 feeling frisky and you want to burn through a two rounder, three rounder as we get onto it later. We'll, we'll knock yeah. that out. We'll bring on, you know, I'll make sure Tigo, who's my co-host here for on, he can come on too. Maybe we can make this a three-way battle. Um, this was a lot of fun. Boys and girls, if you haven't subscribed um, to Project Prospect, if you haven't hit the bell for notifications, um, if you haven't liked the channel, please do. Please show us some support. It helps the YouTube algorithm a lot. And, um, you know, for another episode, of the draft Dodgers on behalf of my uh, esteemed one time co-host here, Pete, the mock yeah. draft guy. I appreciate you, man. Um, look forward to doing more and look forward to. Making <laughs>